Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Carving It Up Live right here on Facebook Live, YouTube, and on Twitter. We are presented by The Grid. I am Bryson Carver. As always, as you can tell, I am very excited for tonight's Orange Bowl between my University of Tennessee Volunteers and the Clemson Tigers. It is appropriate that it's two orange teams playing in the Capital One Orange Bowl tonight in beautiful Miami, Florida. Looking forward to that tonight. I'll, I'll, I'll give a little, little prediction like that at the end of today's show. Patrick Brown of the Chaotic Sports Podcast. Uh, hope to have him by in around 20 minutes or so on the show to discuss his Cowboys, discuss everything going on in the NFL and in the NBA. He's a big Lakers fan as well. Wanted to get his thoughts on the whole LeBron James situation. Seems like he's really frustrated at this point in time with the uh, with the LA Lakers. Um, and at the end of today's show, Week 17, I can't believe that we are this late in the season. It's flown by. Week 17 the NFL season. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll predict the uh, all, all the big games, including if I were a betting man, uh, Bryson's Bleak Bet, the new segment from this season, and a segment that I've done pretty well on this season, my upset of the week. And I'll predict this Saturday's matchups in the college football playoff. TCU, Michigan, Ohio State, Georgia. Two big matchups, two very exciting matchups to close this year's college football season, of course, concluding the national title game about 10 or so days from now. But I got to start with last night. The Dallas Cowboys beat the Tennessee Titans by a final score of 27 to 13. And it seemed like the reaction I'm getting from most of the media and even a lot of Cowboys fans is, oh, God, that's, 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 that's all we put out there on the field against Tennessee and their backups. Honestly, I watched that game and nothing in that game that happened surprised me in the slightest. I picked Dallas to win by 15, they won by 14. I said, Tennessee, this is a Mike Vrabel coach team now. This isn't the typical, you know, average football team, 7-18, and 18, just resting their starters in advance of a big uh, do-or-die matchup next week against their division rival. Oh, no, 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 no. This is Mike Vrabel. This is the same Mike Vrabel who started Malik Willis at quarterback at Kansas City. Did not get a first down in the entire second half. The game went to overtime. Like, that's, that is Mike Vrabel. That is how his team's playing. You saw last night, man. They are running hard offensively. They're hitting you defensively. Tennessee is always going to play hard because every team takes on the mindset and the mentality of their head coach. And you see that, you know, with, with the 49ers. Kyle Shanahan loves to run the football. They're a physical team. Niners are a very physical football team. You see that with the Tennessee Titans. And so, a 14-point win, I had a 15-point win. All right. And I said as well, don't just don't sneeze. Don't 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 look away at Joshua Dobbs or from Joshua Dobbs rather. I said, look, third string quarterback. I get it. Was the third string quarterback for the Titans. Then Ryan Tannehill went down. He ele got elevated to the backup. Mike Vrabel wanted to see what he had in the young guy, as opposed to well, of course he's not that young. He's in his sixth year in the league, as opposed to Malik Willis. I told y'all Joshua Dobbs was going to play pretty well against Dallas uh, on uh, uh, on Thursday night. First of all. You consider the fact that Dallas hasn't been great against mobile quarterbacks this season. You look at the fact that Dallas' secondary is as beat up as they come, and the fact that they don't have any film on Josh Dobbs. And so I looked at him, and listen, his numbers, listen, his numbers are better than anything Malik Wills has put up this season. 20 for 39, 232, a touchdown, a pick. QBR 32, not great. Pass ring of 67, also not great. Oh, Josh Dobbs played pretty well. Been with the team for a week? Having to deal with Early in the game, a monster pass rush against the likes of Micah Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence. Dealing with a lot of drops from Robert Woods, Traylon Burks. I thought Joshua Dobbs was absolutely excellent yesterday. And I think it has become crystal clear for Tennessee. He's their guy next week against Jacksonville. He, he is the guy. No need to have, to have him and Willis split first team reps. Josh Dobbs is your guy next week against Jacksonville. Now, Jacksonville is going to be favored in and should win that game. But Josh Dobbs gives, gives you a better chance to win that game than Malik Willis does. Malik Willis hasn't thrown for 100 yards all season. Josh Dobbs just threw for 232. Like, he's your guy. And he's mobile. But the second thing I was looking at for the Cowboys is, I don't know, they're coming off an emotional win off of a game that they've been looking forward to for two months. A defense that still, despite forcing four turnovers, still, to use the name of the show, got carved up. By Gardner Minshew, I don't know. It's still a Dallas receiving core that, aside from C.D. Lamb and increasingly T.Y. Hilton, who's looked really good, is really limited. Peyton Hendershot, Michael Gallup, Noah Brown, a lot of drops from those guys yesterday. Like, you, you, you see those things. 
More injuries to the offensive line. Looks like Tyler Biotis, the center, did avoid serious injuries. So that's good news. No Tony Pollard last night. Nothing about last night surprised me. Dallas was the, was the team that was favored heavily to win. They covered. They won. Their quarterback, who played below his standard in the first half, was excellent in the second half, and they won the game. I like there, there are a lot of analysts, one whom I I respect, won't say who it is, but I heard somebody say 44 to nothing would be their the final score. I'm like, uh, this is a this is a Mike Vrabel coach team. They're not just gonna roll over and die. Okay, this is a team, this is Joshua Dobbs at quarterback, who is a better quarterback today than Malik Willis is. And I'm not so certain that at this point he hasn't played in one game at a higher level than Ryan Tannehill has for most of the season. That's no scrub they faced on Sunday. Or I'm sorry, on Thursday. So for Dallas, I'm not looking at this with, oh, dang, this is this is kind of an underwhelming performance. i got to be honest with you all, most teams this side of Kansas City, Cincinnati, maybe Buffalo. Of course, Buffalo did kind of wall up Tennessee earlier in the game, so to be fair to them there, that that's about what the game would have looked like. Your second-best offensive player down in Tony Pollard, an already limited receiving core aside from CeeDee Lamb and T.Y. Hilton, a defense that's really struggled the last few weeks. And not to mention, look, this is a decent quarterback you're facing. I tried to tell y'all, Joshua Dobbs is going to put up a good performance. So I, I don't think it's, it's, it's any reason to uh, be skeptical about the Cowboys. There are plenty of examples for that. If you want to say needing a 98-yard drive to beat Houston, okay. Like, that's, that's a reason to be skeptical. Going into the fourth quarter against the Jeff Saturday, led Colts up two. That's a reason to be skeptical, obviously, before the 33-point outburst. There's plenty of examples. Plenty of reasons to be skeptical about these Dallas Cowboys. But when I look at the, the, the entirety of the NFC, outside of Philadelphia, I'm not so sure anybody else wouldn't have put up the same performance Dallas did. Or San Francisco. Throw San Francisco in there as well. So I think San Francisco would have took care of business fairly, fairly quickly. But it doesn't change my opinion of Dallas' team. Everything that happened last night... I pretty much said it was going to happen. They're going to score points. Maybe better in the second half than the first half. They get off to a slow start because of coming off that, that big win against Philadelphia on Saturday. But second half, you understand it's a beat-up team you're facing. It's a game that, hey, listen, Dallas is still mathematically alive for the division, so this game does mean something. But nothing about this surprised me. Uh, my man Ryan Flowers, Clutch Sports Talk, he says, my guy, and he also says Malik Willis is done. Uh, talking about Malik Willis of the Tennessee Titans uh, is is no more. Uh, it currently is the starting quarterback of Tennessee. They, again, I just look at it, and I, I don't think there's any reason to lose optimism, optimism or to gain optimism last night. They went to Nashville, took care of business, and got a win. Like I, I don't think there's any reason to to look at it and say, man, there's, there's, there's some real problems here uh, for Dallas. Um, We'll see what happens at Washington next week. Uh, the game may not even mean anything for Dallas. If it doesn't, rest the starters, give them the week off, uh, give an opportunity to, 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 to get fresh before the playoffs. Because uh, they did that last year. They played a lot of their starters last year, beat Philadelphia pretty bad against Philadelphia's backups, but then obviously a, a, an underwhelming performance, to say the least, against the San Francisco 49ers in the wild card game. But listen, for Tennessee, though, I'm still favoring Jacksonville next week. Make no mistake about it. But I'd be remiss if, if I didn't say I, I, I'm a little more confident in Tennessee now. This is still Mike Vrabel. This is still a solid defense. Derrick Henry will be back. Josh Dobbs, Traylon Burks, and Robert Woods seem to have a, a good connection there in the second half. Watch out for those Titans, okay? This is don't don't bet against those guys. Uh, but I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, matchup two weeks or I'm sorry, nine days from now between the Titans and the Jaguars. Now. I think it's appropriate that uh, piggybacking off of this Cowboys topic, and I'll discuss Dak Prescott's performance a little later in the show, but piggybacking off of this Dallas Cowboys performance, I think it's appropriate to bring on a Cowboys fan and a teammate of mine on the Grid Podcast Network. He is the host of the Chaotic Sports Podcast, a guy that I consider like an older brother to me. He is... Patrick Brown of the Chaotic Sports Podcast. Patrick, how are you doing, bro? I'm doing pretty good, Bryson. Is my audio good on your end? <clears throat> Loud and clear, buddy. I can hear you. How are you doing? I'm doing a lot better than I was the last four days. This going from blistering cold weather last week. Oh, listen. Yeah, I ended up sick the first part of the week. I'm just now starting to get back on my feet a little bit. 
Oh, good. Good but to I, hear that you're feeling better. But uh, yeah, I'm, it's, it's, I'm feeling a lot better. I'll take 60 degrees of rain over oh. blistering Arctic blast. 100. <laughs> percent I, I think that all of America would agree with you uh, in, in your sentiments. So, I mean, let's let's talk. It, it's funny. I'm actually this is the second time I've had you on uh, after a Cowboys Thursday win, and it felt like the games were kind of similar uh, just against the Giants back on Thanksgiving and against the Titans last night. What was mm-hmm. sort of your your main takeaway from last night? I'm sure you heard my opening rant. I don't think there's any reason to be any more encouraged or discouraged after the performance last night um, against, again, this is still a Mike Vrabel coach team in Tennessee. What's what's sort of your takeaway from the Cowboys win? I expected Tennessee to be scrappy from the get-go. I did because regardless of the circumstances of their roster and how many players they were resting for injury, whatever the case may have been, I expected them to be ready to play. That was my first takeaway. Second takeaway was – I was pretty impressed with your guy, Spaceman Josh Dobbs, in the, in the circumstances he was thrown into. I I was impressed with the kid. He looked really good. And this def- this Titans defense, they kept it as close as they could. But, I mean, credit to, you know, Dallas's uh, Dak. What what more needs to be said about, said about Dak Prescott? The guy has literally been – Equipped with below average receivers, a makeshift offensive line, inconsistent play calling, and still leads his team to back to back 12 win seasons and back into the playoffs. So, with all that, I mean, that deserves a boatload of credit. And the interceptions we know is still a cause for concern. The first one wasn't his fault, but the second one was a bad read. And Kevin Bayer just happened to jump Michael Gallup in, and you know it was it was an easy it was an easy pick that probably would have been a ticket to the house. Sure. Yeah, and and again, I'll, I'll sort of get into Dak later in the show, but um, listen, this is a Cowboys defense that we sort of looked at for the majority of the season as kind of the strength of the team. Like the the, the reason that we a lot of folks out there have been saying, "Hey, this Cowboys def- the team is different than last year's," because as good as the defense was last year, as as massive of a jump as they made a year ago under mm-hmm. uh, Dan Quinn as the new D.C., you know, they, they made an even bigger jump this year. Micah Parsons got off to a, a massive uh, start this season, as did guys like Trayvon Diggs, Dorrance Armstrong, and company. Um, the last few weeks, though, they, they've, they've, uh, they've been torched at times, like by Jacksonville, by, by Philadelphia, um, and, and at times last night here and there by, by our guy Space Job, jo- uh, Joshua Dobbs. Um, do you think this has more to do with – the injuries obviously got guys like Jordan Lewis and Anthony Brown who were gone for the year. Late Vanderish was down. Um, do you see it getting any better or at least getting to the point where it was the first two months of the season? <sighs> to be honest with you, Bryson, it's it's a far gone conclusion that th- this defense is gonna is gonna break eventually. You're gonna they're gonna run up against a Philadelphia team if we make it past the first round, and they're gonna be out for blood on the water. A bunch of sharks smell blood on the water, basically. All right. And if Jalen Hurts is playing, I expect it to be straight up uh, in Philadelphia's favor. But a lot would have to go our way on the defensive side of the ball because what have we said about Trayvon? He wasn't gambling on these double moves first part of the season. No, he wasn't. Within the last three or four games, it's like you beat him on a double move, you got him. Because they're, the help over the top is not going to make it there in time. And when you have to go up against these speedy receivers on the outside, like the A.J. Browns, you're in trouble. We can get by with Tampa Bay sure. without question. Sure. But the best the best defensive game we've got to play, once again, is going to be Philadelphia. And I have my doubts about this defense traveling to Philadelphia if we get there. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what I said after the Cowboys won of the Eagles. It gave me more confidence because they did. Listen, I know it was Gardner Minshew. It wasn't Jalen Hurts, who's, who's certainly in the MVP race. Um, but listen, Gardner Minshew is one of the better backups, if not the best backup in the NFL, and still mm-hmm. plenty of weapons. And it took, again, not to get back to Dak, but it took Dak being basically Superman in order for the Cowboys to, to pull it off, dropping a 40-burger on, on a great pass defense. Um, right. l- listen, I think, I think the Cowboys defense – Come playoff time, will be better than they were, say, against Jacksonville. Against You can even look back to Green Bay in the second half um, and things of that nature. I think they will improve. Um, but I think due to injuries, due to, as you mentioned, Trayvon Diggs, and I've been on this thing all season long, uh, and, and I was really hard on him last year, giving up the most yards in the league despite those picks. Like, man, the, the, the film is pretty clear. Just double move the guy, run you know a simple sluggo route, and you got him. 
Um, right. AJ Green did it to him last year. AJ Brown did it on the first drive of the game last week. Um, he, he was solid last night, although it wasn't like he was playing a, a true number one. Um, right. As for Mike McCarthy, so I've been kind of all over the place on Mike McCarthy. Um, situationally, I think he leaves some things to be desired. Um, but let's listen. It, it, objectively speaking, the guy won four out of five starts or five games with Cooper Rush. The guy with a right. roster that at times we we question how deep it really is. Back to back twelve on seasons, Patrick. Like the, the, he's, I think it's fair to say he's been upgraded over Jason Garrett. Um, exactly. Is there any chance that his job is in jeopardy with a a, a playoff exit that is before the NFC title game? I've went back and forth with this for the past several weeks. And one thing I do know as a Cowboys fan, Jerry is very impatient. True. And what we've seen, he gave Jason Garrett the benefit of the doubt for a decade. Right. Mike McCarthy is on a very short leash right now. Very short. So uh, as a playoff exit and not getting to the NFC Championship game, I mean – it's a strong possibility, but who sure. do you replace him? Who would you replace him with? Who who's going to want that job? That it, it's kind of like when you get rid of a quarterback, who do you replace him with? Same goes for the head coach. Sure. Who wants that job? Because as long as Jerry is in the middle of everything, no head coach is going to come in there and be a yes man. So, I, I honestly believe he'll he'll get the benefit of the doubt, but it's very very short. Very yeah, think- very short. Yeah, and I think especially how last season ended with obviously that last play at the end, the quarterback draw, it's, it's left a lot of uh, bad taste. It's bad, left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths uh, uh, this mm-hmm. season. To Dak Prescott, um, and I'm, I'm going to do a segment later in the show talk about the interception uh, uh, situation with him. Um, I think but sort of a preview, obviously half the picks, like the Hendershot play. Hendershot, I think Hendershot should be charged with the interception uh, on his resume yeah. as opposed to Dak. Noah Brown's had a couple of plays like that this season as well. Um, I think Dak's issue with the bad picks, like I said, the second pick to Kevin Bynard, um, the play uh, a couple weeks ago against Houston, uh, where, where he telegraphed it to uh, to, to the uh, Texas defensive back when he's looking for Dalton Schultz. Mm-hmm. I think because I mean, because Dak's number one in the NFL in tight window throws, and we saw the second half, he didn't pull any punches, he didn't like you know reel back on his his aggressiveness. Um, so sometimes picks are going to come with the way uh, that the Cowboys run their offense, the throws that Dak has to make because of the fact that. Outside of C land, the guys do kind of struggle to separate. Um, and not to take any a, a, anything away from Dak because obviously, or any blame because obviously, like the pick last week, it's Philly. It's a bad throw. It's a bad decision. You got to float it more to Schultz there, and as opposed to more of a line drive. Uh, what's your take on the interception issue with Dak? He's obviously now tied for the the lead with Derek Carr in that category. Uh, do you think it is something that could hamper the Cowboys come playoff time? It can because okay. in bad in bad situations where you you keep patting the ball keep patting and you just let it fly i mean you can't do that in the postseason you can't get away with that against you know the 49ers and the eagles you can't get away with that tampa bay you can't because tampa bay's not going to be able to move the ball down the field with their but their offense whatsoever i mean as great as tom brady is they failed to score more than 20 points the last what four games if i'm not they mistaken. haven't they haven't scored 23 since kansas city back in week four so yeah, yeah, they're, they're limited offensively, to say the very least. And we know that their run defense is not that good either. No. So, but whenever you get to the postseason, when you have to go up against the Philadelphias and the, the San Franciscos, those will turn into points off turnovers very quickly. And you look up as a double-digit lead for them, and then you're asking Dak to bail this team out and ask the defense to stop something. But it makes it much harder on both sides because now you're in panic mode. And then you're worried about trying to make the right play, and then you overthink it. And I think that's what Dak is seeing on the field versus just, okay, if I can get it out within a certain amount of seconds, I can avoid interception. But if the corner has a good you know, a good set of uh, length on him, I mean, it's a 50-50. I mean, the receiver's going to make the play, the DB's going to make the play. Right, but when all else fails, take the take the uh, the easy out by dumping it off, you know, for a four or five yard pickup versus trying to take it downfield and then you know an incomplete or an interception, however you want to put it. 
Sure, and and Dak actually talked about on the second pick to um to to, to Bynard. Uh, he he said, "Hey, listen, Zeke's out in the flat. We've got a timeout. Just dump it off to him. Use the timeout and see what we can do from there." Because Tennessee, out, off of the Josh Dobbs completion, now excuse me, down the field, end up getting a field goal out of it, cut the lead a little bit going into the half. Um, shifting from the Cowboys for just a second, I talked about this with with our guy Alfred yesterday, uh, teammate of ours on the Grid of Rocket Field mm-hmm. Jets podcast. Um, the MVP race, it's really fascinating because it feels like Mahomes is kind of the front runner. But I don't think the race is over. Um, the injury is unfortunately probably going to take Jalen Hurts out of the mix. I just read earlier today that he's doubtful to play against the Saints on Sunday. Um, you've obviously got, I think Joe Burrow's still very much in the mix. If he beats Buffalo on a Monday night now, you know, we'll have to have a different conversation because he'll have beaten Josh Allen and Mahomes in the same season, not to mention right. having the best you know, st- statistical year of, of, of his young career. Um, mm-hmm. Who would be your front runner for the most valuable player this season and, and why? I'm going to throw you a, a curveball here. Justin Jefferson. Really? That's, I've heard discussion about that lately. I want to hear what you have to say. What he's doing this year has been done since Calvin Johnson did it. Mm. And I know it's a quarterback driven award. And the word that, like you always say, the word valuable is mis- misinterpreted. It is. But Justin Jefferson has been a top three receiver this year, bro. I, I ain't going to lie. I mean, the, that catch he had in the Buffalo game was ridiculous. No, it was. It was probably one of the best catches I, I've seen in a while. And I've been watching football since 1991. I've seen a it's lot the best of great since it's Odell. Since Honestly. Odell's. But in that degree of circumstances, to keep that drive alive and pretty much safe, Kirk Cousins bacon. Right. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets some votes because he's on the verge of eclipsing 2,000 yards. Receive. Right. He's he's that close, and the way that Jair Alexander's been throwing jabs at him oh. the last couple of days, that's going to be bust CTV. But I mean, Mahomes is going to get it. We all know that because he's done more with less without you know the likes of a Tyreek Hill, but he's still got number eighty-seven and Travis Kelsey, the best tight end in football. Uh, Juju Smith Schuster. I mean, it's his to win. Now the only thing that's going to make everybody change their mind is if Burrow outplays Allen on Monday Night Football, which is the last game of Monday Night Football, which is probably going to be my C- TV as well. Absolutely. So I, I was, if I had to vote, I would put Justin Jefferson in that, that top spot, Bryson. I mean, you can't refute what he's done this year. I mean, he's been one of the top three receivers in football behind the likes of Tyreek and uh, Devontae and Stefan Diggs. I mean, you, you can't refute what the dude's done. He's I mean, he's broke almost every uh, Vikings regular season receiving record since Randy Moss. I mean, he's on that plethora right now. No, he's having a remarkable season. And I you know, remember last year, Cooper Cup, I think, finished third behind Rodgers and Brady for the MVP. So mm-hmm. th- there's absolutely a chance that he could get votes and be in the top three. Sort of my case for Mahomes is obviously, we all know, listen, the quarterback is the most important position in sports. So by definition, um, but 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 also you know what it is if Justin Jefferson's in the mix it, it'll really just be a compliment to him as opposed to a knock on somebody else the fact that he is a, a, a he plays a dependent position yet he's in the running with 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 guys who are you know who are everything to the these franchises in terms of them competing for for Super Bowls mm-hmm. but no he's he's had a remarkable year and, and statistically this season you talk about guys like Tyreek Stephon uh, Devontae Adams and company he he's been to me the best among those guys uh, this year statistically and just just on the field he's been remarkable and I can I, I too cannot wait to see that matchup between him and Jair Alexander considering what Jair talking about that game was a fluke like uh, I don't mm-hmm. I don't know I wouldn't like that fire under a great player but you know it's gonna be must see TV get your popcorn ready as as, as To once said. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I want to shift to the NBA for a second because you're a Lakers fan. Um, and I, I would assume that you you would call yourself a LeBron fan, right? Since 2003. There you since go. he was so in since, high school. Since, beginning. since he was in St. Vincent, St. Mary's, I, I had his rookie jersey from the Cavs oh. the first year. So, yeah, I've been following LeBron since he was uh, uh, a youngster at St. V. St. Mary's. Nice, nice. So he got to, I did a segment on this yesterday. So he got to talking after they lost the Miami, the Lakers lost the Miami Heat and basically saying like, listen, I don't want to retire playing at the at, playing at this level in terms of lack of team success uh, at this stage of my career. And basically what I'm saying, I feel like it's gone kind of underreported. He said four stops in the NBA, uh, Cleveland twice, Miami, uh, LA. Mm-hmm. And both Miami 
and Cleveland have done a better job in the time that he was there and surrounding him with the, the proper talent to compete for titles. You think about Miami, they were in contention all four years he was there. Cleveland, exactly. they were in contention, but two of those seasons, you felt like they had absolutely had the rosters to go win it all, and one season they did. Right. In L.A., they've been legit contenders, uh, Patrick, once in five years. Mm -hmm. And right. it's, it's an indictment on Rob Palenka, it's an indictment on, on Jeannie Buss, the owner, uh, and everybody involved in that Lakers front office. What's sort of your takeaway on LeBron? Do you think, because he's got he can't be traded this season, do you think there's an opportunity or a chance that we see LeBron James in a different uniform next year in year 21? <sighs> I've thought about this, and I've come to the conclusion I'm leaning more 75-25. 75% yes, that he's gone because Rob Polinka is a terrible GM. Yeah. Terrible. If you look at what he's done since he's been there, I mean, outside of 2020, 2019-2020, when you know, we won the championship in a – and a bubble, and everybody wants to say that was an ace or six championship. I'll, I'll say this, because I've been holding on to this for a while about that, because I hear people talk about it. It kind of irks me a little bit. The Lakers were the only team that wanted to be there. True. The Cl it's, it's not the Lakers' fault that the Clippers threw, blew a 3-1 lead. Exactly. It's not the Lakers' fault that the Nuggets got to the conference finals. It's not the Lakers' fault that Miami took my uh, took LA to six games. So for me, I would love to see LeBron compete for another championship. And he's already been on record by saying he wants to play with his sons. That is the ultimate goal for him. Yes. Outside of winning championships, he wants to play with both of his sons. And if the Lakers are not up to it, if I were him, I would uh, you know request a trade after this year because if I mean you missed the playoffs. It's going to be tough for on him knowing that he's put together another remarkable season and passing Kareem, but you're not competing for a championship. And yeah, it's absolutely. just it's just sad to see because you look at the West right now, I don't think there's a team in the Western Conference that has 20 wins, if I'm not mistaken. There, I, mean, the I don't think there, so. Let me check. Because I think it's like 19. No, and then no, everybody actually, I think Memphis and New Orleans. Did, let me check. The, okay, I got the standings right here in front of me. Uh no, actually, no, six teams have 20 wins. Pelicans, okay. Nuggets, Grizzlies, Clippers, Dallas, Phoenix. So, the, the, yeah, the, those they have 20, 20 wins. And then everybody else has got, like, 19 and 18. So 18, it's like a 19, game and, yeah. game and have two games. So right. I, I think LeBron would – I mean, he's going to ride it out, but just listen to that press conference he had. It, it, it sounds like he's telling Rob and Jenny, we need to do something. It wasn't encouraging. It wasn't because I'm sitting there and everybody's like, well, this wasn't the time to, you know, you know, to come out and say it. But you're talking about one of the all time great players in right. year 20 is going to pass Kareem Abdul Jabbar, the all time leading scorer. And he's sure. surrounded by uh, like the, the toys on Misfit Island. I know he had a lot to do with the Russ trade that backfired, but Russ is probably going to win the sixth man of the year award. Uh, Lonnie Walker's been a bright spot, Matt Reeves, but the glass man known as AD, I, I trade him in a heartbeat right now because I would package him and one of those picks to Chicago for DeMar DeRozan or Zach Levine. I like that. Because I can't trust AD. He, he had that stretch where he was averaging 35, Bryson. Yes. Without, without LeBron. Then LeBron comes back, AD gets hurt. I, I don't know what I'm getting out of AD on a, on a yearly basis. If he could give me 70 games, I'll be happy with that. But right now, as a Lakers fan, I'm, I'm frustrated with the front office and how Rob Linka managed to get an extension. And then we were supposed to find out about that. I, I was a, That was kind of like a kick in the teeth for me. That pretty much said, you value Rob more than the roster. And what, what are you holding on to these picks for? No. Trick them no, picks. No. Trade them. Trade them. You got an all time great player in LeBron. And we're approaching the new year in less than 48 hours, pretty much. And today's LeBron's 38th birthday. Happy birthday, LeBron, so, by the way. Happy birthday to the king. So I think they may be working on something behind the scenes, but I don't think the trade for Buddy Hill to Miles Turner is going to happen because the Pacers right now are hot like fish grease. They look good. No, they listen. are. 
they are they beat Boston and I think Miami in that in this stretch. Right. If I'm not mistaken. But yes. If you wanted Buddy Hill, you should have done it last year. I don't think Kyle Kuz was coming back. I, I don't see that happening. Because then you'll have to give up, you know, Beverly and a couple role players, Kendrick Nunn. I mean, I'm good with that, but uh, listen, I, I now I do that trade today. Uh, give up Patrick Beverly and, and Kendrick Nunn because listen, Lakers have plenty of guards. They got Westbrook, yeah. they got Schroeder. Uh, so that that's not their issue. Being able to get size, length, uh, and just just a shot maker on the floor, it would be you know huge for him, huge for LeBron. Uh, our guy Barry, uh, a Lakers fan, along with you, says Rob Plink is the worst GM in the league. At least Mitch talking about Mitch Kupchak had relationships. Uh-huh. He did. And, and again, obviously, in terms of relationships, that's the only reason that Rob Plink even got the job is because exactly. he's Kobe's former agent. And, right. you know, listen, it, it makes my blood boil the fact that Rob Plink got an extension and my man Bob Myers is a basically a, a, G, a general manager free agent next summer. Joe Lakeup, if you are watching or listening, get that deal done, man. They're like, come on. Come on now. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. If, if, if the Lakers make that happen, that would make your blood boil a little <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I never, I, I never forgive for all that Joe Lakeup has done. I'd never forgive him for it, Patrick. Never, I never okay. forgive him for it. Okay, let me ask you this: which one, will, which one will be worse? Watching Kevin Durant go out the door or losing your, uh, your general manager? Which one will be worse? Watching Kevin Durant leave? Mm-hmm. Oh, losing or, general manager because, because I still had the core. I, I still had Steph and Clay and Draymond and all, all the young guys. I still had hope. I knew, I, I knew we could still win a championship. It wouldn't be as clear of a path, obviously. But yeah, yeah, that that was no losing Bob Myers after all he's done in the draft and free agency. I mean, he's the one who got Kevin Durant. And Jerry West was in your front office at one point in time too. And it was his idea to take Clay Thompson back in 2011. Fun story. So yeah, that was he, no, he he was excellent before. I think then he went to the Clippers after that. And you see he's Clippers now, sent. yeah. Right. Um, now, sort of talking about, I was talking about Luka Doncic yesterday. Uh, mm-hmm. Listen, I haven't seen a performance like that in quite some time. 60 points, 21 rebounds, 10 assists. By the way, not only uh, you know putting out that stat line, but doing it in a comeback that we've never seen in the history of the league. Down nine with essentially 30 seconds left to come back and tie it and then win the game in overtime. I said, from what I've seen, I think that ranks third all-time, in my view, among performances. I put Wilts 100, Kobe's 81, 1 and 2. 60, 20, and 10, that's never been done before, even by Wilt. I think you could put mm-hmm. you know, Westbrook's 20, 20, 20 game or uh, Jordan's 69, 18, and 6 game. There, Devin Booker, 70. There's a lot of performance you can put in there. Where would Luka Doncic's 60, 21, 10 game land for you? I right now, that that was something I had never seen, in all yeah. honesty. Luka's a bad man. I mean, he is he's special. A 67 guard that what really stood out to me on that stat line was the rebounds. Right. The rebounds no, is what stood out. I mean, we know he can get buckets, but the rebounds at 6'7, I mean, he's on the. I've seen a lot of basketball my day and time, and I always go back and watch, like, old, you know, I'm a big Michael Jordan fan, and I always look back at the, the Jordan 63 point game at the Garden in the 86 oh. playoffs. You. Well, as we found out in the last dance, and I know we're going back in time a little bit, that was a game where Larry Bird himself said that was God disguised as Michael Jordan. Right. And Luca's performance, it was just like they needed every bit of it. Right, right. Yeah, they, that's they, the thing. It wasn't like it was a stat padding type thing. They absolutely no, it wasn't. needed every bit of it. Because what what do we know about uh, Tom Thibodeau and his, his coaching style, old school? Guys are going to play 45, 47 minutes. Right. They had no legs under, so anything that Luka wanted, he got. So for me, as far as ranking that performance, I mean, I got it in you know in third behind Wilts, 100, Kobe's 81, which I got to see that on television, which was remarkably special. Right. And then you know Jordan 69. I mean, I got to see that too. So it's like I would say top five in all honesty. Right. Top five because. Because there's been some other performances in the regular season. LeBron's had a you know a 60 point game without make without a dunk. And I think he did that in his last year. Miami against the Bobcats, you know, coming back from that uh, nose that. injury. Um, Clay I mean, 60 in 29 minutes. I think you put up there. Clay, that was against the Pacers, if I'm not mistaken. It was and, that's and in, in Indiana in three quarters. In three quarters. So yeah, we've seen some great performances, but. That that's top five for me, Bryson. That Lucas 60 20 performance. That's 
that's top five for me. I agree with you. Now, back to the NFL for a sec. A couple questions left. So, what? And I was talking to Alfred about this yesterday. What's going to be so fun about this year's playoffs is like outside of Kansas City and maybe Cincinnati because they've proven themselves. They've at least gotten to the Super Bowl. We got questions mm-hmm. about everybody, about mm-hmm. their quarterbacks, their coaches, their rosters, their health. Um, I mean, even a team like San Francisco, which I've referred to as the perfect roster, because I, I don't think there's really a weakness outside of maybe corner out, outside of that. They're 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 stacked. They got Brock Purdy, and I like my man Sturdy Brock Purdy. But listen, he's he is a seventh round rookie. Um, who would be your favorites? Alfred had I think Bills and Cowboys, which that would be a rematch mm-hmm. from the nineties. Who would be your favorites to come out today? Let's start with the AFC. Who would be your favorites to come out of the AFC today? Kansas City still. I agree. I agree. Kansas City, because as long as you got Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes, you can't go wrong. He's he's going to do his thing. The defense is a little spotty, but the front four is pretty good. But, yo, know, with D Ford and uh, uh, Frank Clark, it's just the back end that kind of worries me a little bit because their back end is – it's not that good. Their run game is hit and miss, and Juju Smith-Schuster would have to come out and play his best games because Travis Kelsey's going to get his. It's just his receivers need to step, take it up a notch. But if as long as you got Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes and heaven forbid, knock on wood, nothing happens to number 15, the Chiefs are my favorite to come out the AFC right now. NFC... I'm still taking the 49ers okay. because roster, coach, and those two teams are on a collision course. San Francisco, Nick Bosa, your Super Bowl MVP. It's funny. I actually predicted when they when they played the Chiefs a few years ago in the Super Bowl, that was my prediction the Niners win and that Bosa would be the MVP. So, listen, rematch when that was a classic from Miami. The, the final score said Kansas City won by 11, but that thing came down to the last – you know, couple minutes and, and Kansas City obviously had a that was kind of the story of their playoffs a few years ago was that incredible fourth quarter. Um, so before we get out of here, I uh, appreciate you coming on the show once again. Uh, tell the people out there where they can find the Chaotic Sports Podcast and, and really what your show's about. You can find the Chaotic Sports Podcast on the Grid Sports Network along with your show and our other content creators as well. The Chaotic Sports Podcast is one show a week, and I basically dive into the eye of the storm and try to be the voice of reason. Along with that, I use a little pop culture flair to kind of, you know, make it a little bit more entertaining. And I've got my Dak hoodie on, as you can see, your life matters. Got my Dak hoodie on. Um, As you all know, mental health is very dear to me. If you are feeling anxious, suicidal, or depressed, please seek help. Go see a, a, a counselor or a therapist Get your primary care phys, uh, physician to help you that can refer you to, you know, the right resources. And no, if nobody told you today, I love you. Take care of yourself. Everybody that's on the stream, Bryson, all love for you. I'm a big supporter. And anytime you need me to come through, just let me know. I got you. Right back at you, bro. I appreciate you once again speaking to the importance of mental health. Uh, that's that's always been something I've tried to discuss on the show as well. And uh, yeah, I second everything that you just said. And uh, yeah, hats off to you, Patrick. Hats off to the Chaotic Sports Podcast. Everybody go check that out right here on the grid. Have a good one, man. All right, you guys. Watch the rest of your show. Be safe, man. Happy New Year. Yes, sir. Happy New Year to you. That was Patrick Brown of the Chaotic Sports Podcast on the show, bringing good stuff as always. Love having him on. And, and you know, it's funny. And we talk about the contenders in the NFC. Uh, as as many questions as we have about the uh, the, the the sort the sort of contenders in, in around the rest of the NFC and the AFC, you know, there's there's <laughs> AFC Kansas City we love Buffalo's never proved anything. Got in the AFC title game, they've done that. But last year, as much credit as we gave them, as much credit as we gave Josh Allen and company, they lost. They failed to qualify for the AFC title game. And by the way, you know, the opponent that they did beat, the Kansas City Chiefs, did end up getting to uh uh get did end up getting beat by by the Cincinnati Bengals after having an 18 point lead. So it's, you know, there's 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 some stuff there that that, that, that we need to look at in terms of you know whether or not we trust uh everybody else in the AFC as, as stacked as the conference is uh to get to uh this year's Super Bowl. But it's 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 gonna be really interesting to see how uh everything plays out. I'm trying to get this this DAC footage. Uh, or not, not Dak footage, like Dak, uh, 
interception tape on the show right now. Where is it? I know it's on here somewhere. Well, it's not pulling up for some weird reason. Yeah. See if we can get it on later in the show. Uh, we do have a comment here from Barry. This is talking about the Lakers. He said, this is their plan. The Lakers front office is so bad, they will make the stars turn on them to get a rebuild and gaslight the franchise. Let's just say that historically, the Lakers are not a franchise that has rebuilt uh, all that well. We'll just put it that way. That, that, that is a franchise that is notorious for... Uh, they have to get stars. They, they, they draft well... As you, as you can see with some of the stars that they brought in some of the last two years, uh, there's guys they draft, D'Angelo Russell and Julius Randle, uh, Alonzo Ball. Uh, Brandon Ingram was probably their best pick of that group. They're not with the team anymore because they couldn't develop them. They used them as assets. To their credit, got a championship out of it. I can't, I can't hate on that. They got a title out of it. It's not like they came home empty-handed. And that's all that matters in this league is bringing home Larry O'Brien trophies. But in terms of sustaining greatness, they haven't done that since Dr. Buss passed away. They've been in contention once since Dr. Puss, Buss passed away back in 2013. And it's, it, it's, it's been pretty much a train wreck ever since. Um, let's see. I, I think I have should be able to get this on here. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to – I'm getting this DAC footage on, uh, on the show as soon as I can. I've got it in a little folder here. Is that it? Yep, there we go. Okay, so – yeah, get, get that on because I'm about to do a segment on, on Dak Prescott and, and the interception issue because, listen, there there are certain throws that he makes where you're like, what the heck are you doing? There are some where you're like, okay, I see, I see what he's looking at. That was a mistake by the receiver. And then there are some like, it's okay, that is not his fault at all. The receiver should have caught that. Uh, I think the the Hendershot interception uh, last night, uh, that that might have, uh, of Dak's 14 picks, that was probably the num at number one at the top. That absolutely was not his fault. Um Again, I, th I think they should charge him. I know Hendershot's a tight end. They should charge him with the interception for all I care. Okay, because that was that was not good. Um, but no, it, it, Spike, as, as I wait for this footage to get on here, speaking of sort of what Patrick was saying about the MVP discussion, Justin Jefferson, because I think it's a good one to have. Um, now, I would take Patrick Mahomes. But when you talk about value, you tell me, na name the receiver that is more important to their team than a guy like Justin Jefferson. Name that many players in the league that are more important to their team than Justin Jefferson. Because I could argue, value hurts is in the top three in my view. But when you start to have a discussion about it, okay, can the Eagles win? Can, can, they, can they win a couple games with Gardner Minshew? Yes. Now, can they win in the playoffs? Absolutely not. If Gardner Minshew's the guy come playoff time, they will be one and done immediately. If it's Tampa, if it's Dallas, if it's Minnesota, if it's San Francisco, if it's the freaking Giants for all I care, they will be one and done. And so you, you ask yourself, if Justin Jefferson is not on the Minnesota Vikings, what, where are they? They've got, other, they, they've got a, you know, talent there. They've got uh, uh, Adam Thielen, TJ Hawkinson. I, I really like that KJ Osborne kid that got out of the slot, really good deep threat. And we all know Kirk Cousins, uh, and some of this might be because of Justin Jefferson. But last year and this year, dude's putting up outstanding numbers. This year, you, you can say without a doubt, we've always had doubts about Kirk Cousins in the big game. We always have. but. That hasn't been the case this year. 10 and 0 in one score games. And that's why I said when Kevin O'Connell got the job in, in Minnesota, I said that he'd fix the one score game problem. But back to the MVP discussion, it, it, it's a fair one to have. Listen, if Cooper Rush, uh, Cooper Rush, Cooper Cup, my twin, was in the MVP discussion a year ago, who's to say that a guy like Justin Jefferson can't be in this year? Again, like, like Patrick said, he's on pace for 2,000 yards. He's got around 1,700 now. If he goes berserk on a guy like Jair Alexander, who was talking all kinds of nonsense leading into this game, and if next week, I think they play Chicago, maybe? I think it's Chicago. If he goes off on them and they have a bad secondary? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we've, got a, we've got a discussion. 2,000 yards? That's been done since Megatron did it. Back in 2012, I think it was, with the Detroit Lions. Speed, route running, hands, made the play of the year for all it's worth. Make it a, a one-handed catch. It's the best I've ever seen. To me, it surpassed Odell. For me. Because he made it over top of a defender while the defender has the football. In the air, not to mention, Odell's happened in the second quarter. Justin Jefferson happened on fourth down and 18 with two minutes left in the football game. Against a great team in the Buffalo Bills. On the road, in the cold, like, just the circumstances around it. 
I think heighten the moment and make it all that more impressive. Uh, it looks like we just about got the DAC footage ready to go. So it looks like we are we are good in that department. And again, later in the show, I'll predict the college football playoff games tomorrow and week 17 in the NFL, our Sunday action that we will have uh, on tap tomorrow. Um, but I want to talk about Dak Prescott for just a second because you guys know that's my guy. That's my guy. I, it, it's, I left being a Dallas Cowboys fan in part, in large part, because of, in my view, the mistreatment of Dak Prescott by one in particular, Gerald Wayne Jones Jr., because the fact that he... Uh, <laughs> Let's, let's, let's be honest, the, the talent around Dak has never, uh, certainly in the receiving department, been one to brag about. And not to mention the contract situations. So I'm a Dak fan, a Dak fan, ride or die. I was a fan of him before uh, he was even in Dallas. But it would be intellectually dishonest of me to say the interceptions have become a little bit of an issue. Now, let me break down the tapes. So I've, I've got a, I put a montage together of his interceptions this year. It looks like, okay. So I want to start – we got the footage right there? Okay. So I want to start with the footage of the, the interceptions that were not his fault. So when you hear the media, it's 14 interceptions. He's a turnover machine. Well, let's, let, let, let's, let's look at these. So is, is this the right one? Yeah, here he goes. So here's the first pick at Green Bay. CeeDee Lamb just stops his route, and so it goes right to the guy uh, Ford, I think was his name. Made the interception, got a good return of the ball. Second interception, very similar play. And you'll see the replay in a second. Dak drops back over the middle. CeeDee Lamb just totally stops his route. You'll see a better angle of it on the replay right here. Okay, you see you see Dak. He's dropping back. He, he's throwing to where CeeDee's supposed to be, and he stops. You'll see another angle of it right here. CeeDee Lamb. CeeDee's improved massively since, since this play. All right, but the interception. Here you go. Play to Michael Gallup. Gallup, miscommunication. It's supposed to be a stop and go. I'm not stopping. Go a comeback route. He, he says run his go route. Interception. This play. C.D. Lamb trips, falls. Interception by Stephon Gilmore. Okay, so I got what is this? Four interceptions now that aren't Dak's fault. Okay, here's another one. Pass right through the hands of Noah Brown. Right through the hands. Got to catch that. Got to catch it if you know Noah Brown. Here's the other one. Here's the worst one. Noah Brown drops. It goes right through his hands and obviously goes for the game ending pick six against the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, to end that game. And I think we got the Tennessee one. Yeah, here you go. The pass of Peyton Hendershot. This goes number one on the list of the interceptions that were not Dak's fault. I mean, come on. Like, that's, that's, uh, Dak can't put the ball any, any better than that. So they've either been miscommunication or they've been drops. But those aren't all the interceptions. I, I forgot to put the Chicago one in there. It, it has a very similar story to the two Green Bay picks. Let's talk about the ones, though, that were Dak's fault, that were like bad decision by Dak or a bad read by Dak. So we got the tape on it right here. Here you go. So you look at the first game of the year against Tampa Bay. This is the game where Dak hurt his thumb. He's dropping back, rolling out, off balance, tight coverage, Antoine Winfield interception. Okay, so there's one. Here's the one. He's trying to draw a pass interference on the Giants, throwing a CD lamb. Don't, there's no need to draw a flag in the second quarter. Okay, that, that's on Dak. He doesn't, there's no need to try and fit in a tight window and, and hope for the whistle. This one against Houston, there's no excuse for it whatsoever. It's a bad play. Got his arm hit, I understand, but tight window, intercepted. Okay, so we're going to have the next one in just a second here. All right, gets Jacksonville. Again, arm hit, overshoot Schultz, trying to fit into tight window and overshot him, intercepted. Okay, so there's, there's a return. Here's the play against Philadelphia. Now, this, this to me was the worst one. Got intercepted by Josh Sweat, returned to the house for a pick six. Like, that's the, the absolutely 1,000% on Dak Prescott. And here's the last one. Last night against Tennessee, again, great read by Biner, not a good decision by Dak. He's trying to fit it into a window that is simply not there. And that's, if you look at the picks, the picks that were Dak's fault, they all have a very similar story. Dak Prescott this year is number one in the NFL in tight window throws. And that's in large part because he's had to fit them into tight windows. Like he's, he's had to just pinpoint, barely get it through there. Like that's that's kind of been the story of the season for Dak Prescott because his receivers outside of CeeDee Lamb and increasingly T.Y. Hilton, who I I really like his contributions, are way below average. As a matter of fact, they're bad. Okay, Michael Gallup ranks 103rd in the NFL in yards of separation. Noah Brown ranks 108th in the NFL in yards of separation. Dalton Schultz is actually ranked pretty high, but he's 70th. Okay, Peyton Hendershot and and Jake Ferguson haven't had enough targets to qualify for that stat according to NFL Next Gen stats. But the point of it all is. <laughs> Dak's not working with a whole lot out here. And so he's making the bad decision of trying to barely fit into tight window throws. And to his credit, 
Dak's decision-making did not change in the second half. He was still fitting it into tight windows. He's still making ones where you're like, ugh, you, you wince for a minute when he just barely fits it in there to guys like Schultz or C.D. Lamb or T.Y. Hilton and company. So half the I, th I think it's appropriate that half the picks, they're on Dak. Half the picks are not on Dak. It's a 50-50 tail where Dak's got to be better at taking care of the football, not forcing something that isn't there when it's I mean, now if it's fourth quarter, man, go for it. Like that's I want you to be aggressive in the fourth quarter. If you're down, it's a game winning drive situation. You need big plays, you need chunk plays, you got to take risks. But the reason the Cowboys offense has averaged 30 plus points a game since Dak has come back is because they've, they've been more aggressive with him. Because Cooper Rush can't make those throws because he's a backup quarterback. Now, you can win games with that conservative philosophy. That's fine. But you can't get any big plays down the field. You can't sustain drives. And you are hoping that your defense plays perfect. And the Cowboys defense thus far, the last few weeks, has been uh, far from perfect, to say the very least. So, I, I think what it comes down to is this offseason, Dallas needs to either draft a receiver in the first round Go make a deal for a receiver uh, in, 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 you know, during free agency. Go pick up a free agent wide receiver. Something along those lines. Get somebody alongside CeeDee Lamb who Dak trusts. Dak and CeeDee have built a good rapport. Like you saw a lot of those interceptions early. CeeDee Lamb would fall down or he ran the wrong route. or They've got a great connection now. CeeDee's over 100 catches on the year. 1,000 yards. Pro bowler. CeeDee Lamb has established himself, and I did not think I'd be saying this midseason, as a true number one wide receiver. There's no doubts about it. And he has a good connection with his quarterback. Everybody else, T.Y. Hilton's look good, but he's still being worked in the mix a little bit. Michael Gallup has been a drop machine, and the dude cannot get open. His catches this year, even with Cooper Rush, were like, uh, barely, tight window. Noah Brown, not only can he not, uh, not separate, he can't catch. And he can't run, by the way. At least Gallup has a little bit of speed on him. Okay, Noah Brown has become an offensive liability. They need to stop giving him targets, stop getting him snaps. So it's gotten to the point where at this rate, CD is the best receiver for the Cowboys. Consistency-wise, Tony Pollard's honestly been their second. Dalton Schultz, sure, but he's not really a deep ball threat. Like, last night was one of the first few times I've seen Dak throw down the field to Dalton Schultz because that's not his game. He's more of a safety blanket. A little bit of a poor man's Jason Witten, except the difference is Jason Witten was a phenomenal blocker, not the case with Dalton Schultz. And so I think we have to look at it honestly and objectively. Second pick to Biner last night was a bad decision by Dak. The second pick against Houston, bad decision. Philadelphia, the worst decision. Um, Jacksonville overshot him. But you can also look at first pick against Houston, drop pass. Uh, second pick at Jacksonville, drop pass. Uh, first pick last, last night against Tennessee, drop pass. Earlier this season against Chicago, Green Bay, bad route, miscommunication. Again, uh, leading this game, I haven't checked since, but leading in this game, Dak was number one in the NFL in turnovers that were not turnover worthy. Now, you could argue, well, that means he's turning the ball over. It's fair. But again, looking at it honestly and objectively, Dak needs to clean up the mistakes that he's been making, like the second pick last night, or against Houston, or against Jacksonville, or against Philadelphia, which to me was the worst decision of all, because um, he just needs a lot that more. He doesn't need to try a line drive throw to Schultz. Um but they need to improve drastically the wide receiver position because the majority of Dak's picks that were his fault was because he was trying to fit into tight windows. But some of that is going to come with the way the Cowboys play. It's going to come with the way Dak plays or has had to play this season. I mean, I've already argued statistically this year is not as impressive as last year. But in terms of the low Dak's had to carry, I mean, as bad as Dak played in the first half, he finished with a QBR of 78. That's... Pretty good. That's Mah Patrick Mahomes' average, 78. He's top six in the NFL in QBR. It's pretty good. It, again, I told Patrick, it reminded me of the second half in the Giants game, right? Because Dak's in a situation where uh, uh, he throws two intercepts in the first half, similar to last night. One was his fault. One was not his fault. Second half, he's flawless. Couple touchdown passes, was accurate, putting some steam in the ball, uh, moving and grooving. Now, he, he got hurt a little bit last night, which... It's like, oh gosh, like it gives you all the more reason to rest him against Washington if that game doesn't mean anything should Philly take care of business this weekend against New Orleans. Um, 
But yeah, Dak, once playoffs roll around, Dak needs to clean up those mistakes. There's no there's no question about it. He's got to clean up those little things. That one bad throw a game that he's he's tended to make over the last few weeks, he needs to eliminate that from, from what he does. But the other ones, the other half of the interceptions, receivers got to do their job. Catch the pass, okay? It's kind of what you're paid to do. It's what you pay millions of dollars to do every given Sunday, or in this case, uh, Thursday, or in the case of the playoffs, they may be playing on Saturday. I have no idea. I have no idea. But this could be interesting. All right, so before I get into Week 17 NFL predictions, and before I even get into the college football playoff, there is a very big game tonight. A very big game. Uh, it is the Capital One Orange Bowl in Miami, Florida. And appropriately, it features two orange teams. The home team will be the Clemson Tigers. Very accomplished football program under Dabo Sweeney. Two national championships, numerous trips to the college football playoff. And the, the, the kid they got quarterback now, I kind of like. We'll get in him in, in just a second. He's got, got, got a nice quarterback that they will be facing. Out of the SEC, the Southeastern Conference, it just means more down here, folks. My University of Tennessee Volunteers. So, without further ado, let me just give a quick little prediction on that one. Four-point dog against Clemson. And they are going to be missing arguably three of their four most important offensive players. Hen and Hooker, obviously, even if he had the opportunity to play in this, uh, or had the opportunity uh, to uh, be healthy for this game, not going to be able to go. He's injured. Torn ACL, unfortunately. Jalen Hyatt is going to be probably be a first round pick four months from now in April. Wish the absolute best to him. Help pr pr turn this program around. Was arguably the biggest reason we beat Alabama with the Tennessee record of five touchdown receptions. Cedric Tillman, big body receiver, great route runner, speed. Uh, great in, in the red zone, he's out. He's going to be entering the NFL draft. Uh, same can be said about a guy like uh, Jeremy Banks. This uh, this this ball game is going to be hoping to be a high draft pick, high round draft pick is going to be out as well. But I'm hearing a lot of my fellow volunteer fans, part of Vol Nation, kind of get a little little excited, a little a little antsy about this game, right? Because they're worried. Hey, you know, we got our top two receivers down. We've got our starting quarterback down. What are we going to do? To which I say, listen, Joe Milton's one of the better backups in college football. The question for him is going to be, and as you will see tonight, those who choose to tune into this game on ESPN, he's got a monster arm, a monster arm. But it tends to be his worst enemy at times, because he overthrows dudes a lot. But it's not, it's not like he's not going to have the whiteouts from El Keaton, through McCoy, Squirrel White, and you've got the running game, guys, like Jabari Small. Um, uh, uh, Jalen Wright, the backup running back. Really good offensive line. So, Joe Milton's going to have his weapons right. That's not going to be the issue. Defensively, though, for Tennessee is where I'm a little bit a little bit worried. They've had some injuries in the secondary. It's a big reason they gave up 63 against South Carolina. Spencer Rattler, I'll never get over that game as long as I live. They just missed the college football playoff. Anyway, that's what I'm concerned about. Against the likes of Kate Klubnick who's going to be starting at quarterback for Clemson, has looked much better than the guy who's under, DJ Uyunglele, who's in the transfer portal. He's much better in relief. He's not going to get his opportunity, his first start of the season, to my knowledge, against Tennessee. He's got plenty of weapons, and the defense behind him, albeit missing their best linebacker, is still that. Clemson's been one of the best defenses in college football consistently all season long, but I continue to say, say this. They haven't dealt with, they haven't dealt with anything. Mighty orange and white. And for that reason, give me my University of Tennessee Volunteers to beat Clemson 31 to 28 in the Capital One Orange Bowl. We will finish with an 11 and 2 record. If you told me that this was even a possibility before the season started, I would have, I wouldn't say I laughed at you because it is my team, but I would have certainly been a little bit skeptical to say the very least. Tennessee 31, Clemson 28 in the Capital One Orange Bowl, and it will be a great day to be a Tennessee volunteer. We will be singing Rocky Top all night long. So let, let me stop the music for a moment. Let's see. We got a, I think we got a comment here. My guy, Patrick Brown. Good. He was just on the show a second ago. Good luck to your Vols against Clemson. Appreciate that, Patrick. Uh, your Simmons, by the way, looks great last night against uh, Oklahoma. By the way, I think South Carolina, are they playing right now? Oh, they're in a good one. 
John John's John Rivera, shout out to him, fan perspective podcast. John John's Notre Dame Fighting Irish is in a battle with the South Carolina Gamecocks, tied at 38 with seven and, and change to go in the football game in the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl. That is that is interesting. Okay, Pitt beat UCLA. Wow, I just I just saw that because I was watching that game earlier when I was doing some some prep for the show. So there you go. These bowl games have been really good lately. Uh, Kansas made a big comeback, almost beat Arkansas the other night. Like these, these bowl games have been no joke. But as big as they are and as exciting as they've been, they don't hold a candle to the playoff games, to the bowl games that we all look forward to every year. And that is the only ones that matter. The college football playoff. It is down to four. It is down to four. Do we got music? There we go. So... In the first game, in the college football playoff national semifinal game, the Verbo Fiesta Bowl, the TCU Horned Frogs, the Michigan Wolverines, TCU fell short in the Big 12 title game, finished 12 and 1, still was able to get to this playoff game. Certainly caused a lot of uh, uh, discussion among many, uh, many people like myself, but they're in. Michigan, on the other hand, undefeated, 13 and 0. Big Ten champions. What a remarkable season. Another remarkable season by Jim Harbaugh getting his team to another Big Ten title and right back to the college football playoff where they were in this position a year ago. Two seed facing uh, a three seed who just lost their conference title game. The difference was that was the eventual national champion, Georgia Bulldogs. These, is the, these are the TCU Horned Frogs. Now, I want to give TCU love, their love real quick. Real quick. Sonny Dykes has had a remarkable first season as the head coach of the Horned Frogs, getting this team to the playoff. And they're a lot like, it's funny, they're both purple. They're a lot like the Minnesota Vikings this year in the NFL. Great in one-score games. Now, obviously, they lost in overtime to Kansas State, but all in all, one-score games in the fourth quarter, they've been great. And that's in large part because of their experienced senior quarterback, a guy by the name of Max Duggan, who, in my view, among the Heisman finalists, finished exactly where I thought he should have finished, and that is second to that award to, of course, Caleb Williams, who is the rightful winner of the USC. Team has a loaded offense. You've got a receiver. You're going to see him tomorrow. He's going to probably be a top 15 player in this upcoming NFL draft. He is remarkable. Big body guy, a uh, deep threat, one of the better receivers in college football. TCU's defense, as Big 12 defense tend to do, though, has struggled at times. And going against a Michigan offense, well, albeit they don't Blake Corum, that backup running back for him, did you see what he did against Ohio State a few, uh, few weeks ago? A month ago or so? Ran for buck 50, 200 yards, something like that. J.J. McCarthy, who I had questions about, similar to the questions I had about Stetson Bennett. He played the best game of his life against the Buckeyes in the horseshoe. So when I look at Michigan's weapons, when I look at Michigan's defense, which has consistently been the second best defense in college football, I think it's going to be too much for TCU. Give me Michigan, Michigan to cover the 7.5-point spread, 38-20 to 20 over the TCU Horned Frogs in the college football playoff in the Fiesta Bowl tomorrow. Michigan is the first to advance to the national title game. Certainly will be very, very exciting for that fan base. The one, though, I, th I think outside of Michigan and TCU that we are all looking forward to, and that is the Ohio State Buckeyes against the defending national champion, Georgia Bulldogs. So, Big Ten, SEC, big matchup here. Ohio State failed to qualify for the Big Ten championship game. Obviously got housed by Michigan at home, uh, but... The committee felt that like that they had done enough, their resume was good enough to get to this game. So they're here. George, on the other hand, consistently from literally from opening day all the way to now, has been the best team all year in college football. 13-0 SEC champs for the first time since 2017, by the way. They didn't win the SEC title game last year against Alabama. They're in a position now where they can become the first team in the college football playoff era to win back-to-back -back titles. Folks, this baby's going to be a shootout. Georgia's favored by six. It is going to be a shootout. Georgia's defense, which has been outstanding all season long. Give them their props. That, that Carter guy that they got in the middle, number 88 for, for Georgia, a lot of NFL ex, uh, draft experts, the Mel Kuypers of the world, Daniel Jeremiah's, they've got him as a top two pick. He is he is the best interior defensive lineman that I've personally seen going into a draft since Adama Kinsu out of Nebraska. He's been that dominant for Georgia. Uh, it, it's a defense that Ringo kid, They've got a corner, has been excellent this year. He shut down my man J Jalen Hyatt when they met uh, in Georgia earlier this season. 
but they are facing CJ Stroud, who's had a little bit of a disappointing year by the standards we thought uh, we would see from him coming into the season, and Marvin Harrison Jr., who has simply been this year the second best receiver in college football to my man, Jalen Hyatt. But Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, obviously a lot to live up to, considering the fact that his dad was a Hall of Fame receiver with the Indianapolis Colts. Um, has been outstanding this year. Catches the touchdowns, the yards. He's been outstanding. Ohio State in the last few years has almost become a little bit of a wide receiver U. I mean, it's been, I mean, they had Chris Olave last year, dominate with the Saints. They're, they're, they're outstanding. The run game that they have, the offensive line that they have, the fact that, listen, they've had a bad taste in their mouth for a month. They've had to hear also for a month by many folks saying, why didn't Alabama get in? Alabama was, was very competitive, albeit in their two losses against Tennessee and LSU. Ohio State, the best opponent they played, they got destroyed at home by Michigan. Trust me, when you hear that week after week after day after day, when you're going to the facility to work out or to study film or to practice, you are constantly thinking about that all day, every day. Keep in mind, this Georgia defense gave up 30 points to LSU's backup quarterback in the SEC title game. So don't expect this to be some sort of runaway for Georgia. Now, Offensively for Georgia, they're not as good as the defense, but they still are stacked. They got that kid, uh, Brock Bowers, the tight end, who next year is going to be a, 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 probably a top 15 pick in the NFL draft. He's a remarkable player. Uh, they've got a great McIntosh as an excellent running back. The offensive line's good. You guys know I have my reservations about Stetson Bennett, but to his credit, he has had a very good season. He's very athletic, by the way, being able to move, move outside the pocket, making plays. He'll, he'll be forced to do that tomorrow against Ohio State. I think it's going to be close. But in the end, I'm going to roll with the defending national champs. I'm going to roll with the Bulldogs, 45 to 38. It is going to be a barn burner, folks, in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. Give me Georgia 45 to 38 over Ohio State to win this game, go to 14 and 0, and be put themselves in position for a rematch with Michigan to win a second consecutive national title game. It's going to be fun. It is going to be a fun two games. Again, I think Michigan wins fairly comfortably. Um, but Michigan, I'm sorry, TCU's got the playmakers to give Michigan's defense problems. I just think it'll be a little bit too much. If, if Kansas State in the interior gave, in the trenches gave uh, gave TCU issues, no reason that Michigan can't do the exact same, if not more so. Uh, but Georgia, Ohio State, I'm excited for that one. And listen, the thing that, if you, see that, I just gave my prediction. That's what I think's going to happen. That like that's what that's how I think the games are going to play out. That's what I think the scores are going to be. What I hope to happen? Oh, I want, I want a rivalry in the national title game. I want us. We saw. Remember, we saw Duke, North Carolina in the Final Four this past year, and what ended up being a Coach Case final game. Remember that? I want to see a rivalry, probably the best in college football, certainly the most competitive in college football at this stage in time. Ohio State, Michigan. For the national championship game, the intensity, the bad blood. Oh my goodness. You want to talk about musty TV? We got we gotta see this. This would be like if Alabama met Auburn in the national championship game. Uh, this would be like, say, I'm trying to think of another great uh UCLA met USC in the national championship game. Oklahoma met Texas in the national championship game. This would be that equivalent. And listen, we've seen all SEC national championship games with Alabama and Georgia, Alabama back in the day against LSU. And what was the defensive battle in the Sugar Bowl? Listen, it's going to be a good one. It's going to be, I, I want to see Michigan, Ohio State. And I'm going to listen, but Ohio State's absolutely got a shot to beat Georgia. Absolutely. Heck, Missouri almost did it. But I think, it's, I think we're going to get a, a number one seed versus number two seed in the national title game in beautiful SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, California. Georgia, Michigan, that's what I think is going to happen. Uh, but we do have some NFL games. Trying to get the background music pulled up for that. Oh, I think I had, I might have had the music turned off. That's unfortunate. I think I might have had the music turned off for uh, for the predictions, it looks like. Well, let's get that fixed. So, week 17, the NFL kicks off. Or, it's already has kicked off, rather. But it kicks off in... Now, on Sunday, with some really good matchups. So, before I get into the games, let me go ahead and pull up 
my record for week 16. So week 16, decent week. I went 10 and 6. Overall record 151, 86 and 2 with a 632 winning percentage. Hoping to improve on that as time goes on. I think we're in for some really, really interesting matchups uh, tomorrow night. Or I'm sorry, Sunday uh, afternoon, Sunday night. Certainly the best game of the week will be on Monday. Bengals, Bills. But we got some dandies on Sunday. We got some games between teams that have absolutely nothing to play for, which I'm about to predict right at the back. Get that over with. But I'm on the contenders. There's some good matchups. So let's go and get started right here. The Arizona Cardinals, the Atlanta Falcons, two teams that have been mathematically eliminated from playoff contention. Atlanta in this game is a field goal favorite at home, essentially saying that this thing is, is essentially a pick -em. So be quick with this one. For Arizona, they are going to be using their fourth quarterback of the season, David Blau. They've gone through Kyla Murray, Colt McCoy, Trace McSorley, and now David Blau at starting quarterback. Fun fact about David Blau, came, came from Purdue, played pretty well a few, years ago, a few years ago when he was given the opportunity on Thanksgiving Day for the Detroit Lions. So they're at least, I wouldn't say competent quarterback, but they're, they're serviceable at the quarterback position uh, with David Blau under center. Now, for Atlanta, they've got their own young guy. They've got Desmond Ritter starting at quarterback uh, for the Falcons this Sunday. Um, Atlanta's just ravaged with injuries. The defense is beat up. Uh, Kyle Pitts is done for the year. They've obviously traded Calvin Ridley. Drake London has been great, but hasn't really gotten as many opportunities as of late to shine with Marcus Mario and Desmond Ritter at quarterback. I think it's safe to say Atlanta's going to be in, in the mix for a quarterback this upcoming draft. Is it Will Levis? Is it CJ Stroud? There's plenty of guys they could choose from uh, to, to possibly follow them, but uh, I, I think Arizona just had, listen, they still got DeAndre Hopkins healthy. They still got enough weapons. I'll take the Cardinals 19-17 to 17, uh, in somewhat of an upset over the Atlanta Falcons to win this game. Arizona beats Atlanta 19-17. Let's move on to a game that actually matters. It's a bad team against a team fighting for its playoff life. The Chicago Bears and the Detroit Lions. Lions are pretty decent favorites in this game, minus six. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm loving this one. So, I'm off the Chicago bandwagon in terms of whether or not they can upset teams. I'm, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I had the upsetting Buffalo last week. It's the worst pick I made all year. Let's just forget it ever happened. Let's just put that in the lost column and move on. Justin Fields has been outstanding this year, but the last few weeks has been a little bit beat up. Um, listen, they, they've done all they can, it feels like, with what they have offensively. They, they're obviously limited in that, in that department. Uh, Chase Claypool's been pretty much a non-factor. I don't think the Bears have won a game since they traded for one Chase Claypool uh, from the Pittsburgh Steelers at the trade deadline. Uh, it, it, it's a pass defense that has been absolutely torched the last few weeks by the likes of Josh Allen, Aaron Rodgers, elite quarterbacks, but like... It's, it's looked easy for these guys every Sunday. So going on the road to take on a guy in Jared Goff, who I personally thought should have been a pro bowler this year, given his play, especially with what's a solid offense, but not what we would call a loaded offense. So Monterey Set Brown has been good. Josh Reynolds and company. Um, Detroit is the playmaker. Chicago's absolutely decimated in the secondary. I think the Lions are going to cover, and I think they're going to crush Detroit 35-17. to Detroit wins this game. They are in really good positioning to get to the playoffs in the NFC, give me the Lions to win this game 35-17 to over the Chicago Bears. Another division rivalry with serious playoff implications. The Denver Broncos going to Kansas City to take on the Chiefs. Chiefs, big favorites at home, as you would imagine, minus 12 and a half. So Denver obviously fired Nathaniel Hackett, in my opinion, long overdue uh, last week. Obviously, you got the Russell Wilson situation. There's more reports, which I, I, I was hearing reports about this from the sources I trust back in like week three about him having an, having an office and a parking spot. And that's been kind of the story this week ever since the firing of Hackett. You've had guys like Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler come to the fence of their quarterback, which certainly is a good endorsement for Russell. But they're going on the road to Arrowhead Stadium to take on the Chiefs. Now, I could see this being a little dicey early. Because look, Russell, as bad as he's been this season, he has been as bad as one could possibly be, especially making $50 million. That's it. As best game this season against Kansas City, teams this season that have fired their head coach have tended to look good. Carolina won. Indianapolis with Jeff Saturday won. The only win, but they won against the Las Vegas Raiders. The interim head coach for the Broncos happens to be the guy that they brought in to help Nathaniel Hackett manage the game, manage the clock. So that's not exactly the best uh, position that you want to be in as an organization. It's a division rivalry, though. I think it's at least close early. Kansas City, Patrick Holmes, understanding the MVP statement that he needs to make to hang on to that award. 
I think they dominate in the second half. Give me the Kansas City Chiefs to cover. I'm sorry, not to cover, uh, to to barely uh, miss covering this 12 and a half point spread. It feels a, I would put it more at minus 11, which is why I have Kansas City winning by 31 to 20 over the Denver Broncos. I'd have it more minus 11 than 12 and a half. I feel like that's pushing it a little bit because again, Denver did. Listen, Denver was pretty competitive with Kansas City earlier this year. Uh, let's look at another division rivalry. It's kind of the theme this week. It's definitely going to be the theme next week because it's all division games in week 18. Miami Dolphins, New England Patriots. Patriots are favored in this game at minus two and a half. It is desperation times for both of these teams. So Miami wins. To my knowledge, they're locked into the playoffs. They're locked in, uh, although the Jets, I think, could catch them, so it's a little dicey in that situation. But the Dolphins put themselves in much better positioning to make this year's NFL postseason with a victory. Obviously, Tua Tagovailoa is out due to a concussion. So it's going to be Teddy Bridgewater. Now, Teddy is a guy, he's a, he's a well-traveled man. Been all over the NFL, Minnesota, the Jets, the Saints, where else has he been? Carolina, Denver, and now here with the Miami Dolphins as Tua's backup. He's going to be the guy on Sunday. Now, this is a Patriots defense that has been kind of up and down this season in terms of getting to the quarterback. Matthew Junon has done just that. But in the past, in, in the secondary, they've struggled to take the ball away at times. And offensively, it's the, the, the tape says it, the stats say it, your eyes say it. They've been awful. Mac Jones has been terrible this season. Okay, Matt Patricia's been bad this season. Ramondre Stevenson, who was really the, 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 the good aspect of their offense, now he's fumbling. Yeah, he had the lateral to Jacoby Myers a couple weeks ago against the Raiders in that miracle play. And last week he fumbled on the last drive of the game against Cincinnati. Cost New England a chance to win the game. So this is desperation times for New England. Keep in mind, Bill Belichick. Fun fact, folks. Bill Belichick has beaten the Miami Dolphins twice since 2019. Now, those two games were against Brian Flores. Most of those games were against Brian Flores, but back in week one, Dolphins won fairly comfortably against New England. Now that was in warmer conditions. But this is a Miami team. We saw them against Buffalo, and it gave me a little more hope for the Dolphins moving forward in that they can at least be competitive in a playoff game in cold weather cities. They went to Buffalo in essentially a snowstorm and ran the ball all over the Buffalo Bills. So going to Foxborough, that's not going to be an issue. To my knowledge, this, there's not expected to be any sort of uh, snowy conditions, icy conditions um, uh, in Foxborough, in New England. New England favored minus two and a half. I don't get it. Miami still does have this guy. Maybe you've heard of him, Tyree Kill. They still have this guy. Maybe you've heard of him, Jalen Waddle, who just took an 86-yard touchdown pass to the house on a slant. That's the kind of speed that they have. That's the kind of playmakers they have. Cedric Wilson, uh, Sherfield, they, they've got plenty of them in Miami. Mike Gusecki, uh and, and the run, running game, which has been excellent. Jeff Wilson, as I said, was the most underrated move at the trade deadline. The Dolphins made it. They will win this game in New England and eliminate the Patriots from playoff contention. 26-19, to Dolphins get, I guess, somewhat of an upset win over the New England Patriots. 26-19. to Miami wins, puts themselves in much, much, much better position to compete in the playoffs. Moving on to the Indianapolis Colts taking on the New York Giants. Giants, pretty solid favorites here, minus five and a half. What I'm looking at this one is this. Uh, the Colts offense sucks. Uh, that's not breaking news to anybody. Nick Foles came in last week. For those hoping for a Nick Foles type of performance, vintage performance like back in Philly, he didn't get it. He didn't get it. He was bad. Threw three picks. Bad completion percentage, bad QBR, bad pass rating, bad everything. Okay, you, you, look, you look at a guy in, uh, who's a receiver. Michael Pittman Jr. has had a really solid season given the instability they've had at quarterback. Maybe expect if Nick Foles plays poorly again, expect to see maybe a Sam Ellinger sighting. I really like Sam Ellinger in college at Texas. To see him against this Giants defense. Listen, I think the Giants' lack of weapons is going to get exposed in the playoffs. But listen, they're at home. Daniel Jones has been playing good football. Played well, albeit against the Minnesota Vikings, who have a horrible pass defense. But played well last week at Minnesota. Brian Dable, to me, is the front runner for Coach of the Year. Saquon Barkley's having an outstanding season. I think still's a shot to win off. It's a player of the year. Uh, just the Giants outmatch the Colts in every aspect of the game. Not to mention the Colts, since Jeff Saturday has taken over, unsurprisingly, have been the worst fourth quarter team in the NFL. If you need any evidence of that, I'll hand you two games. Dallas outscoring them 33 to nothing in the fourth quarter alone on a Sunday night in Arlington. And then a week later, sorry, two weeks later, they turn around, go to Minnesota, 
And they blow a 33-point lead and get absolutely clobbered in the fourth quarter and in overtime. This seems like an easy bet to me. Should have been my fire a bet, man. Give me the New York Giants to beat the Indianapolis Colts 28-15. to Expect more offensive struggles from the Colts. Giants win 28-15 to over Indianapolis. Moving on to a very big game in terms of the NFC East and in terms of the number one seed in the NFC. It's the New Orleans Saints and the Philadelphia Eagles. Two teams that I predicted to make the playoffs before this season. One is already in by, you know, by a mile. One, it would take an absolute miracle for them to get in. That would be the Saints. But they still do have something to play for. Philly favorite in this game, minus five and a half. So what I'm looking at for the Philadelphia Eagles is this. Jalen Hurts is going to be doubtful, or is doubtful. It's been announced by Coach Nick Sirianni. So it looks like it's going to be Gardner Minshew for the second straight week. Now, for all the bad, the interceptions against the Dallas Cowboys this past Saturday, Gardner Minshew still did throw for 330. Okay, he still did throw for, was it three, two, three touchdown passes? He is fine. He's one of the better backups of the league, as I've said for the longest time. I, I've always said I would take him over Baker Mayfield. Great touchdown to interception ratio. Decent arm, not going to blow you away, but he can get the ball on time, on target to his wideouts. And listen, this is the Saints defense that's been better in the last few weeks, but at times has struggled this season, especially in the fourth quarter. So I expect this one to be really close throughout. Um, I do not see Philadelphia covering. I think, listen, it's a desperate Saints team. It's a Philadelphia team who understands, hey, we don't win this game. There's some pressure on us next week. We don't win this game. Dallas is probably going to beat Washington a week from now. We got to beat the Giants, who are a playoff team. So I think I think Philadelphia understands the moment. They understood they didn't have to win last week in Dallas. They win this game. They win the NFC East, and they clinch the number one seed. And for the players, they're like, hey, we get two weeks off because we'll get the first round by. We'll get two weeks off. We'll just go ahead and take care of business now. I think it's close. But give the Philadelphia Eagles to win this game 24-20 to over the New Orleans Saints. Moving on to another divisional matchup, one that will decide a division. The Carolina Panthers and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for the NFC South. Did we ever think we'd be saying that before the season? Tampa Bay is a field goal favorite at home, and essentially Vegas is saying you just pick them. So I will. Thank you, Vegas. The Panthers come in. Sam Darnold, really the biggest concern for him, has been turning the football over all throughout his career. Thus far in his starts, that hasn't really been an issue. They run the football effectively. They play great defense. And this has been a team that, look, that they've they've been able to get after the quarterback. Brian Burns has had a good season. Um, their wideouts, guys like, uh, what's, what's the kid's name out of, um, oh, I'm forgetting their tight end. I'm, I'm blanking on his name. He's been good for them this season. Had a big game at Seattle. This is a Carolina team that understands what they are offensively and defensively. As for Tampa, it has been about as bad as you could be the side of the Denver Broncos, obviously, offensively. Tom Brady's had arguably the worst season of his career, as has Mike Evans, as has pretty much everybody in this Tampa Bay offense. It's a team that struggled to run the football with Rashad White, Leonard Fournette. Right now, I would probably roll with Rashad White before I would roll with Leonard Fournette. That being said, you look at what they're that they're putting out there defensively. Okay, you look at a guy like Devin White, Devontae David, that pass rusher number nine they have, the next one. So Tampa Bay's defense, expect this to be a defensive battle. Expect this to be a low-scoring game in Tampa Bay. Vegas, to me, has this line perfect at minus three. This sucker is going to come down to the wire. Carolina's not blowing Tampa Bay out. Conversely, I don't. on the other hand, I don't see Tampa Bay blowing Carolina out. But if it's close, that's the thing about Tampa this year. They've been in a lot of close games. And in those, they pulled away because they have the greatest quarterback of all time. Was, excuse me, he struggled this season, but he is still the greatest. Tom Brady, I think, leads a game-winning drive, a walk-off field goal by, by Ryan Suckup, win this, wins this game for Tampa, 20-17 to 17 over the Carolina Panthers. They are favored by three. I think it is right on the money by Vegas. I think they win this game 20 to 17 on a game winning field goal over the Carolina Panthers to clinch the NFC South. And for those guys, and Tom Brady in particular, get a week off before they have to play, in all likelihood, the Dallas Cowboys on Wild Card Weekend. It is now time for Bryson's Bleak Bet, the one game every week that I have absolutely no confidence whatsoever predicting. But hey, we got to predict the games. That's how it works. So I'm looking at this one in our nation's capital, Washington. 
Cleveland Browns, Washington Commanders. Commanders in this game favored at minus two. Uh, I don't know what to do with this game. So Carson Wentz is going to start for Washington, replacing Taylor Heineke. This will be Wentz's first start since, I believe, week... Gosh, week five, I think, against the... Or week six, I'm sorry, against the Chicago Bears on a 12-7 to win on Thursday night. Yes, it was as unwatchable as it sounds. So Carson Wentz, we understand that his biggest issue outside of last year when he only threw seven interceptions, it's been decision-making. It's been turnovers. Uh, he tends to be a guy a little bit... We're seeing this a lot from Dak this year, trying to fit it into windows that aren't really there. Difference between Wentz and Dak, Wentz gets incredibly gun-shy in the pocket. When Wentz makes a mistake, either plays safe or he's trying to will his team back in the game. A little bit of Andrew Luck there. For Cleveland, Deshaun Watson has not played great since coming back from suspension in the first four games since. Um, again, I, I this is kind of what I expected for him. I, I did not expect him to play well, uh, given the long absence, not playing all of last season and not playing this season up until whatever it was, week 13, I think it was, against Houston. So I didn't expect Deshaun to play well. But he is facing a Washington defense. It's going to be it's going to have Chase Young in the lineup. But what I would look at for Washington, Antonio Gibson is going to be out. And with the struggles that Washington has had is in the in their offensive line, I expect this to be a monster game by Miles Garrett. I think Miles Garrett's number one pick in the 2017 draft gives the second pick of the 2016 draft Carson Wentz all sort of problems. Give me the Browns. Bryce's Bleak Bet and have no confidence at all in this pick. These are two teams that have been on Bryce's Bleak Bet quite a bit this season. Browns win over the Commanders 26 to 21. Let's move on to another one. So, this game for both teams means nothing but for different reasons. For Jacksonville, they could lose, like what I said about the Tennessee Titans yesterday, they could lose a million to nothing, they could win a million to nothing. It does absolutely nothing for their playoff chances. It put them no puts them no closer to getting into the postseason. Because we all know next week it's gonna come down to that matchup in Duval. My Jags fans out there, Jags Titans to decide the AFC South. But for this week, it's got a revenge game type feel. They're facing the Houston Texans. Obviously, two wins. It would actually help Houston if they lost, because you know you, you you would imagine the fans would like to get the number one pick, have their choice between some of the great young quarterbacks in this year's draft, trying to rebuild this franchise. So, you look at Houston. They played team, teams close this season. Took Dallas to the wire. Took Kansas City to the wire in overtime. And won last week in Tennessee, albeit against the Titans with Malik Willis and not with Joshua Dobbs. If Joshua Dobbs would have started that game, make no mistake, folks. Tennessee would have won. But I'm looking at Houston. The defense has played great this season. Given the circumstances, given the expectations, the defense has been really good. They take the ball away. They get to the quarterback. They get pressure. And against a team like Jacksonville, that could possibly cause issues. It's the biggest reason that Trevor Lawrence had arguably his worst game of the year, throwing a crucial red zone interception earlier this year uh, when that game was played in Jacksonville. But for the Jags, a few weeks ago, they looked dead in the water. What were they, 4-8, and eight, I think, at that point? They've won three straight games. They are right back in the AFC South. And again, it's going to come down to next week in Jacksonville. And most people, including myself, believe the Jags are going to win that game. It's a revenge game. A Doug Peterson was talking about he's not going to rest his starters. He's going to play everybody. Try and get some momentum going into that big matchup against Tennessee. Two, One of Houston's two wins this season comes against the Jags. To me, Jacksonville gets revenge. 31-23, to they cover the four-point spread, and they beat the Houston Texans by a final score, once again, of 31-23. to Again, Houston, make no mistake about it, they will put up a fight against those weird... Those, those, those weird Jacks, I'm sorry, the, the weird Texas will put up a fight against the Jacksonville Jaguars. It's, it's, it's going to be a it's gonna be a funny game. I'll put it that way. Because, again, Jacksonville has nothing to play for. It's going to be weird. It is now time for my what used to be my favorite segment of the week. It has now become my Achilles, Achilles heel. It is time for... What are I a betting man? If I were a betting man... I actually feel pretty big, good, good about this one, folks. I'm looking at a battle between two former Bay Area rivals. It's the San Francisco 49ers and it is the Las Vegas Raiders. And boy, folks, does Vegas love San Francisco. Not talking about the Vegas Raiders. I'm talking about Las Vegas, Las Vegas. They love the 49ers. Minus nine and a half. I'm all over this one. If I were betting in, that is it. Brock Purdy has been playing outstanding since being inserted in the lineup due to the Jimmy G injury. Was great against the Miami Dolphins. 
was great against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, played pretty well against the Seattle Seahawks, and dominated the Washington Commanders defense last week. So facing a Raiders defense that doesn't take the ball away, that struggles to get to the quarterback, folks, they're last in sacks. Despite having Chandler Jones, despite having Max Crosby, they are last in the NFL in taking the quarterback to the ground. And so with the young guy, with that running game, with that roster, and by the way, Debo Samuel may or may not be able to go. We'll see. I mean, listen, he got injured a few weeks ago. We thought his season was over. He's practicing now. So we'll see if he's able to go against the likes of the Las Vegas Raiders. This is a team that is psychologically done. They benched Derek Carr. Obviously, there's a lot of... Clearly, there's the locker room didn't like it. You heard what Devontae Adams said. There was a reason that Derek Carr stepping away from the team so as to, quote-unquote, not cause distraction. This is a this is a really screwed-up locker room right now. If I were a bet man, I know it's a big line, but take the Niners to cover 38-10. to 38-10. to 10. So, Jared Stidham's in against the best defense in football. I think the Raiders will struggle to get into double digits. If they struggle with, with Derek Carr, without him, sorry, Jared Stidham, making the first start of your NFL career. I have a bad feeling it is going to be a long, long afternoon for you, sir. Our bet, man, take the Niners to cover the minus nine and a half point spread and win this game at 38 to 10. Um, looks like you got a comment. John Rivera, okay, it looks like Notre Dame has won because John Rivera just commented uh, that the Clovers... Real quick, let's let's take a break in the action to see what happened in Notre Dame. Or not in Notre Dame, at the Tax Slayer Bowl. Oh, there you go, 45 to 38. How about those Irish? All right, so I know my, my man Grady Edwards, who's a big South Carolina fan, I know he's probably not very happy about that. Uh, but yeah, great win for Notre Dame, Marcus Freeman. Great job, John Rivera. Great job to the Fighting Irish. Back to our regular schedule programming. Moving on to this one, it, it took me a minute on this one. The New York Jets and the Seattle Seahawks. The Jets are road favorites. Think about that. You know, this, John John will like this. Jets are favored minus one and a half. They got Mike White back. They got their best quarterback this season back in the lineup. Zach Wilson has reportedly played his last game as a New York Jet, is the reports I'm hearing out of the Meadowlands. Uh, for all the co- quarterback controversies and back and forth going from Flacco to Wilson to White, back to Wilson, to C.J. Strebler, now back to Mike White for the stretch run for these last two games of the season, which the Jets have to win to get into the postseason. It's a situation where 7-8, and eight, they've got a defense. The Williams brothers talked to Alfred Parsar Jr. on the show yesterday, Rocket Field Jets podcast. Go check that stuff out. But he was talking about the Williams brothers, Sauce Gardner, who's probably the defense rookie of the year going away. Uh, you, you talk about guys in, in you know, C.J. Mosley, They've, they've been great. Quan Alexander, offensively for the Jets, they've got the playmakers. Garrett Wilson. Okay, they've got the good tight ends. They're fine. Problem was, they were still limited at quarterback the last few weeks. Could get them the ball. Mike White is able to do that. For the most part, he tends to be a mistake-free quarterback. Not going to take a ton of shots down the field. He's a little bit conservative. A little bit, a, a little bit of a, a rich man's Cooper Rush, if, 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 we, if you, we could put it that way. But as for Seattle, they've been kind of a little bit of a free fall as of late. Okay, I think they've lost three straight games, if I'm not mistaken, at this point. Geno Smith, ever since that comeback win against the Rams, has been really bad. Turned the football over. He's been inaccurate. And this is going to be kind of a revenge game for him, right? This has been the best season of Geno Smith's career. You know, he still, I think, has still at least a chance to win comeback player of the year. Facing his former team, the team that drafted him, the team that's the reason he's even in, he's even in the NFL. And it's a must-win for Seattle, too. This is essentially an elimination game for the Jets and for the Seahawks. Two seven and eight teams that need to win and probably need to get some help to get into this year's postseason. But I trust the Jets' defense, and I trust Mike White to get this W on the road in Seattle. Give me the New York Jets to beat the Seattle Seahawks. They do cover the spread, the minus one-half point spread. Jets beat the Seahawks 24-20 to in Seattle. Pretty much eliminate Seattle, eliminate Seattle from playoff contention. They certainly need a ton of help in order to get in, uh, e- even this week, much much less next week, to get into this year's playoffs. Jets get to 8-8 eight and eight and give themselves a shot last week of the season. I know Jets fans will love that. All, listen, all you want is a shot to get in the postseason. They will have that because they will win this game 24-10. Uh, sorry, 24-20 over the Seattle Seahawks. It is now time for my upset of the week. Give me the Minnesota Vikings. 
to beat the Green Bay Packers 28 to 25. Packers are three point favorites. The Vikings will win by three. And here is why. So Green Bay, there's a lot of discussion over the last few weeks. Hey, you know, they, they could sneak into the playoffs. Hey, you know, Aaron Rodgers, last time he threw 11 interceptions, the Packers won the Super Bowl. Yeah, there's a big difference there. Back then, they had Mike McCarthy. Now, they had Matt LaFleur. Back then, they had a top five defense. Now, they do not. Back then, they had a defense that could take the ball away. Now, they do not. And now, they have a cornerback. Great corner, by the way. And Jair Alexander talking all kinds of smack to Justin Jefferson. Talking about that week one game in which Justin Jefferson double-digit catches for a buck. 83 is a fluke. That's, that's, what, that's not my words. It's Jair Alexander's words. So... A guy who's, as Patrick Brown talked about earlier in the show, is in the MVP race in Justin Jefferson. Quote the great Michael Jordan. He gonna take that personally. Kirk Cousins in his career, folks, you may not know this, has a winning record in his career. Washington and Minnesota has a winning record against the Green Bay Packers. Has a great passer rating, touchdown to interception ratio, yards, everything. So, Kirk Cousins always plays his best football seemingly against the Green Bay Packers. If only he could play them in primetime uh, once Monday Night Football or Sunday Night Football rolled around. I just think, listen, Green Bay's been feasting off either beat-up defenses or bad defenses in this three-game winning streak. Folks, they beat the uh, Chicago Bears with a horrible pass defense. They beat the Los Angeles Rams, who have a beat-up defense. They beat the Miami Dolphins, who have a beat-up defense. This week, I'll, I get it. They face arguably the worst pass defense in football. The difference is, that team's got Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen. I almost said James Cook. That's uh, Dalvin Cook's brother. Dalvin Cook, good offensive line. TJ Hawkinson, KJ Osborne. They got weapons galore. I expect a turnover from Aaron Rodgers. A costly turnover in the second half of this game. And I expect Kirk Cousins to do what he's done his whole career. That's ball out against the Green Bay Packers. And I expect Justin Jefferson, by the way, to get that much closer going into Week 18 to 2,000 receiving yards in a single season. Once again, upset of the week, in which, you know, a segment that I've done pretty good on. At least for upset of the week, right? 8-8, eight and eight. That's, that's not bad for upsets, I guess. 28-25, to 25, Vikings beat the Packers, eliminate Green Bay from playoff contention. Let's move on now to the Battle of L.A., two Los Angeles teams. One in the NFC, one in the AFC. It's the Rams and the Chargers. One team is completely out of the playoff mix. One just clinched their spots in the dance last Monday night. Rams, Chargers. So Chargers in this game are favored at minus six and a half. Uh, th this is going to be an interesting game in terms of home field advantage because both teams really don't have a home field advantage because they play in the same stadium. So I'm going to be interested to, to hear the, the cheers and the boos and the oohs and the ahs in the crowd on Sunday afternoon. It's going to be really interesting. That's for the Chargers, right? The defense, which has been much blind all season long, they're getting healthier. Joey Bosa is going to be coming back soon. Khalil Mack's been playing great. Uh, Derwin James will, see, you know, coming back. Obviously, he had that hit that got him ejected the other night on Monday Night Football, but he's been having a great season. Uh, and this is a Chargers defense that over the last few weeks has been really good in terms of points allowed, yards allowed. They've been excellent. They've been one, among the best in the league. As for the Rams, coming off a shellacking of the Denver Broncos, 51-14. to 14. Baker Mayfield playing arguably his best game as a pro. Amazing completion percentage, had a couple touchdown passes. Great QBR and a great pass rating actually surpassed Dak, which made me a little mad. But Baker Mayfield played great last week against a solid Denver defense. So this week gets the Chargers defense. I think it's to be a little bit of a different story. We've got film on Baker now with the Rams. Brandon Staley, for all the criticism I have of him as, him as a head coach, he's gotten the defense shirt up. Justin Herbert, Chargers offense, coming off a pretty underwhelming performance against the Colts. I expect them to make a statement. I think they will win this game over the Rams in the Battle of Los Angeles. 30-16 to over the Rams. Chargers win the Battle of LA. 30-16 to over the Rams to get to 10-6 and six and try and possibly give themselves an opportunity to get to as high as the 5 seed in the AFC. In our final game, another divisional rivalry. We got the Pittsburgh Steelers taking on the Baltimore Ravens. Ravens in this game are favored to minus two and a half. Another team in Pittsburgh, not dead yet. Need some help, but they're not dead yet. They're seven and eight. They're going to need teams like the Jets, the Dolphins, uh, the Patriots to lose ahead of them. Uh, pretty much everybody else in the AFC is going to need to, to, to lose. But when I'm looking at a team like the Steelers, you know they play great defense. Uh, that's been their MO. Mike Tomlin, we understand the 
Once again, third or third straight week, fourth straight week. No, I'm sorry. No, third third straight week, if, if I'm not mistaken, where his record of not having a losing season, 15 consecutive years to this point, is going to be on the line once again. Trying to get to 8-8 eight and, eight and keep his Steelers in playoff contention. Obviously won that last second game against uh, Vegas last week. The pickup was, was fine. He was great in the last drive. George Pickens was really good. Caught the game when he touched down pass. Najee Harris was the best player in the field in that game. So we know they can run the football and they can air it out down the field. As for the Ravens, again, Lamar Jackson is out for this one. It's going to be Tyler Huntley. Uh, obviously got a pretty limited receiving core. Devin Duverday. I mean, it's, it's, it's not great. Uh, Baltimore has been running on fumes the last few weeks. They're at home. They did beat Pittsburgh earlier this season at Acrisure Stadium in Pittsburgh. But coming to Baltimore, MT Bank Stadium, I'm going to go with the upset. I think the Pittsburgh Steelers win this game. They get to 8-8. Eight and eight. They're still alive. And Mike Tomlin is still alive to keep that record of most consecutive wins in NFL history without a losing season. Uh, most consecutive season in NFL history without a losing season. 20-17, to 17, it's a typical Steelers-Ravens defensive battle out there. So many Hall of Famers have played in this game. I think we're going to have at least one Hall of Famer in this game in T.J. Watt, uh, considering the, the 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 history he's had in this league, winning a defensive player of the year and being as dominant as he has been getting to the quarterback. I think it's going to be a long afternoon for the Ravens, or long uh, long evening for the Ravens. Give me the Steelers to win 20-17. to 17. I like their receiving core more. I like Kenny Pickett a little more than I like Tyler Huntley. And listen, it's a battle between two great coaches, but I, I'm, I'm going to roll with Mike Tomlin on this one to get a big road win. Get to 8-8. Eight and eight. We'll see what happens next week for the Steelers. They'll need some help to get in, but they'll still be alive. That's my predictions. And, and the great thing about it is that the best game is on Monday. We got a great game to finish week 17. Monday night football. Ravens. I'm sorry, uh, Bills. Bengals. I, I'm hoping just for the sake of drama that either... Cincinnati loses and Baltimore wins or both teams lose or win because I want to see the drama to where Baltimore, Cincinnati play next week to decide the AFC North. And all the storylines will probably be centered around one guy, Lamar Jackson. Will he be healthy? Will he be ready to go? We'll see. It's going to be interesting. See what happens. Before I get out of here, this is my last Carving Up Live show, my typical Monday, th uh, Thursday, Friday Carving Up Live show of 2022. This year's flown by, but we do got one more show tomorrow at noon. The Carving It Up 2022 year-end special recapping all the best moments in sports and the best moments of the show this year in 2022. It's been a great year for Carving It Up Live. So many amazing guests, uh, so many great uh, uh, recurring guests on the show. So many great sports moments to talk about. Uh, you know, some some rants, some bets that were won and lost by me. Uh, some times where I was right on the money, and some times where I could not have been more wrong. That will all be recapped on the carving it up 2022 year and special. There you go. Once again, carving it up 2022 year and special will be tomorrow live at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific time on Facebook Live, YouTube, and on Twitter. So be sure to check it out. But with that, that is all the time we have for today's show. Appreciate everybody stopping by. Big shout out to Patrick Brown of the Chaotic Sports Podcast for stopping by to talk all things football and NBA as well. We're in for an amazing sports weekend, folks. College football playoff, NFL Week 17. My balls tonight against the Clemson Tigers. It's going to be exciting stuff, folks. So, uh, yeah, be, that is all the time we have for today's show. Be sure to stop by on Monday. January 2nd, 2023. There you go. It's weird to say, but 2023 is a couple of days away. 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter. But again, before that, check out the New Year's Eve special tomorrow, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific time, Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, recapping all the best moments in sports and the best moments on Carving It Up Live. So be sure to check that out. May, may or may not have some guests. We'll, we're trying to get that worked out, but see if we can have some guests on that show. Um, but also be sure to like, share, comment. Hit that big red subscribe button. Take two seconds out of your day. Hit the big red subscribe button and hit the notification bell. Get notified anytime we upload a new video, which we just did with the Mac Jones uh, hit on Eli Apple video. Going to try and get a Derek Carr up video up soon. Anytime we go live, do a video, do a short, any of that. Be notified anytime we uh, put any new content out there. And also be sure to subscribe to the Grid Network. That is right, the GRYD Grid Podcast Network, of which I am a part of. You saw Patrick Brown earlier. You saw Alfred Parsler Jr. yesterday. 
Chaotic Sports Podcast, Rocket Fuel Jets Podcast, respectively. You can check their content out as well as mine on YouTube, as well as the All Even Podcast of Barry Grant Jr., Cowboys Cam Fan Podcast, uh, All Even Podcast with, with Barry Grant Jr. I don't think I'm missing anybody. I don't think I'm leaving anybody out. Am I? No, I, th I think I covered them all. Yep. Chaotic, Rocket Fuel, my show. Uh, all even podcast, Clutch Sports Talk, and the Cowboys Cam Fan Podcast. We got some great content out there, folks. Be sure to check it out. And that is also where you can listen to my show and all of our shows on the Grid Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, as well as wherever you listen to your podcast. If you are not able to stop by the show tomorrow, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, New Year's Eve special, I hope you do, but if you are not able to, happy New Year, happy 2022, uh, last, for the last time, happy holidays. What a year it has been in sports. What a year we hope is going to be in sports in 2023. Have a great weekend, everybody. Please stay safe out there. Happy New Year. God bless you all. Oh, be sure to take care of your mental and physical health as well. Forgot to mention that. Take care of your physical and mental health as well. God bless you all. And peace out. Go Big Orange. Here we go. Thanks so much for watching the show on YouTube. Be sure to click that big red subscribe button and go check out the other clips and full shows of Carving It Up Live. Have a blessed day.